Welcome to Film at 50, a podcast that celebrates semi-centennials in the world of cinema. I'm your host, Brian Rowe. Very excited to welcome Jonathan Moore back to the podcast for our Halloween episode. This is going to be dropping, Jonathan, not only Halloween weekend, but on my birthday, Friday, October 28th. So this is the very important episode. Well, happy <laughs> birthday, Brian. Happy birthday, Brian. Yeah, so we're recording this at the very beginning of October, but this will be airing at the end. We're talking Dracula AD 1972. As always on Film at 50, the last week of October, we have to do a horror-themed episode. And there is a vampire film starring Christopher Lee that opened in November of 1972. I mean, the date's even in the title, Jonathan, so we have to talk about this one. That's true. And there's no getting around. It's not like, well, this could have been like a year late. Nope, this was 1972. It was 1972. <laughs> Except in France. Except in France when it come out there in 73. Yeah, and they had to change the whole title. Yeah, I feel like that immediately dates a movie. When the, t when the year it came out is in the title, I don't know if I like it. Well, you know, the thing is that if you're looking at this 50 years ahead of the, like we are, um, then it just is like a date. It's like, oh, <laughs> something happened in 1972. Wow. Yeah. Go check it out. You know? But I'm happy we don't have a lot of movies now that are like 2013. <laughs> it's like 10 years on. We're like, oh, okay. I, I think it dates a movie a little bit. And oh, this what one. What was that end of the world did. movie? Was that 2012? Is that the end of the world? Remember that? Well, one? yeah, but that was about the date. That was like that came out oh. in 09. That was about the oh, what if the world ends in 2012? This could have been about some groundbreaking thing happening in 1972. <laughs> That's true. If it was a historical document. Yeah. But yeah, most movies, if they're called a year, like it has like there's a very specific part of the plot that plays a role in that. I don't think this movie had to be called 1972. It could have been 68, 74, right? But now that we, we know that it's 1972, <laughs> we can look back on this and understand why people are dressed the way that they're dressed <laughs> and why true. they're dancing the way they're dancing and listening to the music that they're listening to, you know? Why, so we, ha why we have a musical number at the beginning. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a period piece now <laughs> that's right but it wasn't when it came out everyone was like oh this is modern and hip i don't know i really <laughs> i don't know what audiences of the time would have looked at that as yeah um, i mean I this know. is the year of cabaret and the godfather and deliverance and some really excellent films and i can't imagine those audience members going to this movie in november of 72 being like wow so this is modern vampire cinema well, I don't know if it so much as modern vampire cinema, but is that what life was like for the teenagers? You know? <laughs> it's still kind of a dreary time for horror films as we reach the end of 72. Like the one I've watched this whole year that has like some life that's a, like a little bit different than everything else is Wes Craven's Last House on the Left, which came out in August. Like that movie feels of its time. But a lot of the other horror films we've looked at this year, some for the podcast, some not, that I've just watched outside of the podcast for 72, do kind of feel like they're stuck in 1965. <laughs> like, well, this I, one was definitely not 1965, <laughs> Brian. But it, this it, was it, it did feel, it felt old-fashioned in its tone. You will be very proud of me, Jonathan. We talked about this last time. I said, I'm going to watch a few of the Christopher Lee va vampire movies, the Dracula movies, before we talk about AD 1972. And in the last month, I watched three of them. Oh, good. Uh, for the first time, I had never seen Horror of Dracula. I had seen that clip of like the close up of him with the uh, with the red eyes. I'd seen that Shame. clip. Shame. But I'd never seen the whole movie. I don't, I'm like, how did I never see this? And loved it it was oh, beautiful good. fantastic like one of the great classic horror movie watches i had never seen before uh in the last year or two like it was a lot of fun like good. i love i but what's funny is that in the la last couple of weeks i watched brides of dracula and dracula prince of darkness and mm -hmm. then now this dracula yeah. 80 1972 and not a lot has changed 
since Horror of Dracula, which came out in 1958. <laughs> they still kind of feel like they're made in 58, which I found kind of disappointing. Like the, the highlight of this journey, Jonathan, was Horror of Dracula. That was spectacular. Yeah, it's a great film. Um, so let's, uh, what, do you want to start with that one? Want yeah, you want to, yeah, yeah, let's, let's kind of, that. let's kind of work our way into yeah. 80, 1972. Let's start with Horror of Dracula, yeah. which I guess is called Dracula everywhere in, else. Yeah, just not in the U.S. because Universal owns the rights to Dracula in the United States. Oh, interesting. Wasn't there a 70s movie called Dracula with like Franklin Jella? Yeah, Universal. <laughs> oh, it's Universal. Yeah. Oh, okay. So if you want to call it Dracula, you, it has to be a universal movie. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so that makes sense. I like the title Horror of Dracula. I like that. I don't like that if it was just called Dracula. Yeah, no, so it I, would I'm be on like, board. It, would, it would almost be like, you know, making a movie in 2018 and calling it Halloween. <laughs> exactly. You can't do that. But uh, yeah, so like, what was your kind of introduction to the the first of the Christopher Lee Dracula movies? Like, when did you first watch that? Okay, so there used to be this thing on the cable, Brian. It was on American Movie Classics, the name <laughs> of the channel, AMC. In the 90s. Yes, and it used to be called Monster Fest. Mm. And so I would tune into Monster Fest and... Uh, it must have been a, probably 1999, mm -hmm. 1998, somewhere around there. Uh, I tuned into Monster Fest, and they had, I think, Whoopi Goldberg was hosting. Oh. Uh, and so uh, they were doing all of these different uh, monster movies, and so there would be like a different monster that would be featured every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this one weekend I tuned in, and it was all Dracula. And so that was really exciting uh, because I got to uh, just – chill in the afternoon, turn on the TV, and watch Dracula films. So my very first uh, Hammer Dracula film that I saw was Dracula, Prince of Darkness, which is mm -hmm. why that one has a very special place in my heart, because it was just, it was very horrifying to me. So uh, <laughs> in terms of... It is. Like, yeah, like the, the blood and, and like him coming back to life, it was, mm -hmm. it was, it was very, uh, it, was, it, was, it was really cool. You know, it really stuck with me, and so yeah. I, I liked it a lot. So that was my first introduction, because uh, I because they played them in order. So they played uh, Horror of Dracula, then Brides of Dracula, then Prince of Darkness, and then they were going to play the next the next one in the the series or whatever. <laughs> the no, the other so, seven. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, but I watched uh, 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 Prince of Darkness, mm -hmm. and that was uh, a really exciting experience for me. And so then I decided uh, then I got this little book. Uh, at the book fair, I actually have it sitting over there. It's called Vampires, Ooh. an investigation or something. And then they go through and they, they talk about all the different vampire movies uh, and like vampire things. It was part of those. It was one of those scholastic books, right? Mm -hmm. It's a cool book. And so uh, I was able to to look into that and uh, check out all of the other films in the Hammer series. And then they like tell you what they are about. And so uh, I was able to go to Borders. Do you remember that store? I remember Borders, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Boy, times have changed, haven't they? I Since love Borders. Too. Yeah, I like Borders a lot, too. I was able to go to Borders, and they always had good prices on their DVDs and stuff. And so I was able to go, and I was able to get uh, Horror of Dracula. And so I was able to purchase Horror of Dracula. Oh, okay. And so that was my uh, first time watching Horror of Dracula. So I watched Prince of Darkness first, and then I watched Horror of Dracula. And so my experience watching Horror of Dracula was that it was really, it was very well done. Uh, it was a great, uh, a great presentation of the Dracula plot, I thought. Mm -hmm. They did a nice job of condensing it, you know, taking out all of the extraneous stuff mm -hmm. and presenting a, a pretty good plot. And I liked uh, Christopher Lee. As Dracula, I I I liked um, Peter Cushing as Van Helsing. They were all really uh, relatable. They did a great job. Um, they changed up some of the names and stuff in Horror of Dracula from the book and from mm -hmm. you know, previous adaptations and stuff. And so that took a little getting used to. Uh, and so I watched the movie, and of course, you know, it's got the music right. Bum 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 <laughs> yeah. bum bum. Very operatic which is, you know, really cool. Uh, and that was one thing that I want to talk about in this uh, 72 movie when we get to that. 
Yeah, music. So remind me. Yeah. <laughs> but um, this, uh, you know, it's just a fantastic gothic opening with the gargoyles on the side of the castle mm-hmm. and, you know, all this other stuff. And so it was really cool. Uh, it was different from Universal's Dracula for me because Universal's Dracula feels so much bigger. Mm. Like it's like soundstage wise, like Universal's Dracula was much larger, right? Because they yeah. got the, the painted the matte paintings and stuff to finish Mm -hmm. off you know a lot of the sets in dracula's castle so and a lot of this story takes place inside dracula's castle which felt very claustrophobic to me and so that was one of the things that has always bothered me about uh, the hammer dracula films is just sort of a claustrophobic feel that i i get from hammer Mm -hmm. dracula yes i didn't i didn't necessarily get that from prince of darkness um i think it was because prince of darkness sort of takes place in multiple areas um, and so that was uh, my introduction to Horror of Dracula. And then my introduction to Brides of Dracula was actually on vacation somewhere, maybe at Disneyland. And it was on the TV uh, when we got back from Disneyland. And it was just playing on uh, one of the channels. And so watched, of all of all movies to, to be playing <laughs> when you get home from Disneyland. That's okay. right. So and that was Brides of Dracula. And that was cool, except. Dracula wasn't in it. There was, you know, this blonde guy. And yeah. That, that kind of bothered me. Uh, <laughs> it bothered it's, it's me, too. Child. Oh, okay. Well, see it's, see, it's not just bothering me as a child. It's bothering you as an adult. So. Except the fact that at the end of Horror of Dracula, he's turned to dust. Okay. So it made sense in the f- direct follow-up Brides of Dracula that he wouldn't be back for more. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So but- that's sort of my... Uh, when I first experienced all of those films in particular. Yeah. So, I mean, horror of Dracula is 1958. That's an interesting time for the genre in the late fifties. It's kind of a time for like science fiction movies more so like movies that, you know, have like giant reptiles and spiders and, you know, them, the thing, you know, all of these things. When did the blob uh, come out? The blob is the fifties. I know, but what year? Uh, I think 56 or 57, something yeah, around there. Yeah, I thought it was around that time, yeah. But, like, the horror genre is kind of dead right now. Like, you have, like, the occasional movie that transcends in the 50s, but that is not a great decade for the genre, especially in the United States. I feel like there's some internationally, like Diabolique is really scary, and that's a 50s film. You have Alfred Hitchcock movies, of course. I wouldn't really call his 50s films horror films, though. Those are more suspense thrillers, suspense, right? Yeah. Like Rear Window is great and scary at times, but it's not a horror film. It's more of like a mystery mm-hmm. thriller. So, yeah, so we're, audiences aren't getting much. So Horror of no. Dracula in 58, you know, enough time had passed since the Bela Lugosi film from 1931 that I think, like, people were ready for... Uh, you know, a new Dracula movie that plays on some similar ideas and themes, but it's in color. It has blood. It has a little bit more makeup effects, special effects. And it like that seemed like the perfect movie at the right time, like late 50s, like a new Dracula with Christopher Lee. And what what I found interesting is watching these sequels going from 58 all the way to 72 to see like how the horror genre evolves from the late 50s to the early 70s. And how the filmmakers, they're not really kind of, I mean, the only thing they're doing is they're adding more blood. (laughs) That's like it. (laughs) Like we go to 60 Brides of Dracula, which is fairly similar to Horror of Dracula in terms of its look and everything. And then Dracula Prince of Darkness is 66. And so we're now we're pushing the boundaries a little bit more. That scene of the body being like hung over and, uh, you know, the ashes of Dracula Yep. And the blood is coming out and resurrecting <laughs> Dracula. Like that scene is pretty grotesque and it's it like, pretty shocking. It is. I mean, it, it almost feels like something that should have been like 70, 71. I was like, yeah. wow, that was 66. I'm yeah. sure some audience members were probably, you know, running into the aisle. Like, <laughs> like oh, I can't, I can't handle this. Yeah, so, no, I, I'm glad you, you also found that to be pretty, uh, pretty uh oh, for its time it, it's not shocking yeah. to me now <laughs> like of its time 
I was like, wow, okay. I don't know if audiences were ready for this in 66. No, but... I, I don't, I don't think they were. I mean, and that, that's an interesting thing. And I, and there's, I haven't had this discussion with anybody else uh, about that particular scene, but I'm glad that you have you having watched this for the first time, mm -hmm. uh, seeing that, experiencing that also made that observation because it was really, really kind of gross. And it's in color. So you, you see the blood, you see like the slow transformation of Dracula's ashes into a person. Like it, it's takes place over the course of a minute or two. And it's, you know, and it, yeah. you, you see all the, like the different kind of icky. And like, it's super well done too. Like gunk. And it's like, Oh, like it's, it's super well, done, well yeah. done. And the hammer uh, uh, horror of Dracula uh, where he sort of disintegrates and turns into ashes is also <laughs> super well done. And so then when I would got to, you know, this movie, I was expecting maybe something of a similar caliber to either of those scenes. And we just didn't get that <laughs> no. for the resurrection. No, but I was, I was happy because I'm like, okay, wait a second. So at the end of horror of Dracula, he's, he's turned to dust to ash. How was Christopher Lee in a bunch of sequels as Dracula? It makes no sense. And I was, I was happy that in Prince of Darkness, they really did reckon with that. They weren't just like, oh, he's, you know, someone's, you know, sings a little lullaby and he's like all of a sudden back to his normal self. Like they really show you how he comes back. I think the problem there is that once he's able to come back and be fully formed after being turned to dust, it's like, how is there any suspense in the sequels to come? because he can be turned to dust again and then they'll just resurrect him again. There's like, it's like Michael Myers, you know, Jason. It's like, okay, it doesn't really matter. I mean, he can be just like blown to bits and they'll, they'll figure out a way to bring him back. But well, that's a minor the great quibble. thing about monsters though. <laughs> you can never truly destroy them. <laughs> as long as there's more dollars to be made. That's right. Right. It's so, like we're uh, recording, we're recording this in early October and everyone's like, oh, yeah, this is the last Halloween, Halloween ends, the last one. I know. But yeah, for like a couple years. <laughs> well, it's probably They'll the last one. It's probably the last one with Jamie Lee Curtis. She has said, yeah. I mean, it's hard to, I mean, she was done, done after the, the, you know, the last couple she did in, you know, the late nineties, early two thousands. But then they came to her with this idea and she was like, okay, so. I just think she's in her. Well, early, she couldn't end on resurrection. That was a horrible she way. Couldn't to end. end her story. Well, she died though in resurrection, so I it didn't make sense for her to come back. So I, I was they, like, you know, landed on some trampoline or something. I was I mean. like, okay, so we're just gonna throw away sequels now. Like we are at that stage where we can just pretend like sequels didn't happen and just it's just a direct sequel to the first. And now it's, it's like, it's, okay, it's, anything it's, can no, happen. It's now. really interesting. It's real. It's really interesting where the film industry has gone. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, it's it's absolutely fascinating to me. And so that we can just start all of these different storylines yeah. and, you know, they're all like branching out into different universes, you know, sort of taking that Marvel cinematic universe, you know, whatever. You've got all these different multiverses and things like that. And we're just applying that to everything now. Like you can just watch a movie and like, oh, well, this takes place like in, in, in your mind. You can like this takes place in some this universe, but this doesn't take place in this universe. Yeah. And people are just like on board with it. And it was <laughs> it's, it's like really weird because, you know, for decades we had to have everything make sense in our minds. You're like, OK, so this character dies here. Yeah. And so this character comes back here and this is how they do it. And you had to be really creative with it. Right. But now you can just be like, oh, no, alternate universe. This character didn't die here. Things ended up totally differently. So we're going through this timeline, yeah. going through this storyline. And honestly, while it does create, a, I think, a creative deficit, I enjoy it. I enjoy the fact that we can have multiple versions of multiple mm -hmm. characters in multiple timelines. <laughs> and then you can pick your favorite because then you're like, I don't like the way that they, you know, they did Michael Myers in, you know, this yeah. movie. And you can just say, well, that that's in that timeline. But this timeline, you know, the the curse of thorn timeline that that's like the best Michael Myers. Right. So you can just do all of, all of this other stuff. And I mean, it's all fiction. So I guess it makes sense. And yeah. I've come, I've kind of come to terms with it. It's just, it is, you're right. It's very interesting. It's very bizarre. The Halloween franchise is a choose your own adventure of how you want to watch them. I mean, there's like seven or eight different ways you could watch those movies. <laughs> yeah. Like, I choose to believe that H2O happened. I love H2O. It's got some flaws, but that's a really fun movie. And it's the hardest part for me watching this new trilogy by David Gordon Green is that, okay, so H2O 
didn't happen. <laughs> so it's like, it's just, you know, it's just a weird thing. It's like, okay, what? And then it's like, at the end of the day, it's like, who cares? They're just, they're just movies. Like, it's okay. They don't have to all make sense and relate to each other. It's but, fine. <laughs> but H2O basically said that Halloween four and five didn't happen. Yes. It was in the script, but they cut it. And it's hard when it's like, I mean, not everyone has seen every sequel. So if you're trying to explain away in the new movie, like what happened in the last seven, it's like, you're going to lose the audience. They're like, what? Like people showed up to the 2018 Halloween. They didn't care. They were, how many people besides like really hardcore horror fans were like, wait, but she died in resurrection. Like 98% of people like were, they didn't care. (laughs) I know it's interesting. And I think that's an interesting part that sort of ties back into 1972 yeah. is that this scene in which Dracula and Van Helsing, like this is probably the last great hammer scene ever with them on the, the coach, you know, struggling at over the, the beginning. Coach. Yeah. Like this is probably the last great hammer scene, mm-hmm. like in the history of the <laughs> whole studio. And, uh, there, you know, f- Dracula and Van Helsing are fighting over this, uh, coach and then the coach tips over and they land and the wheel and you know it's just bloody and you're and you're watching this and as somebody that watched you know horror of dracula rides mm-hmm. of darkness you're like when did this happen <laughs> like what, where, did, where did this come from yeah like, i haven't seen it... the three or four that come before this have you seen the other ones between prince of darkness and this there's, there's like four other ones so, so this scene that we're that we're that we're talking about right now does not happen okay anywhere doesn't no. relate to the previous movie doesn't okay. relate to any movie it's just sort of like they give us sort of sort of like you can walk in fresh like ha- never having seen any other hammer dracula film and you get like this prologue of yeah. you know this is van helsing and dracula's relationship and this is how dracula died and it's a really cool way for dracula to die mm-hmm. um but it has no connection and no correlation to any other Dracula, okay. which which got me thinking, is this and the movie does set this up that for this to be this is a theory, but it sets it up as a possibility. If this Van Helsing that's destroying this Dracula mm-hmm. maybe is not the same Van Helsing from horror. It's of just Dracula. a different timeline. Yeah. Well, no, not a, like he could be like that Van Helsing's father. Oh. And so oh, they okay. have so like a whole same. you know history of Van Helsings. Uh, trying to defeat Dracula, you know, they sort of pass it on through the generations, which they do lay out the foundation for that in this film. Completely. I was I was taken with the opening of Dracula AD 1972 because it opens with a bang and a big action scene, whereas the other three I watched, all they open very softly, quietly, takes about a half hour for anything to happen. It's like, you know, it's kind of like about atmosphere. And this one opens with a bang and you're like, okay, let's, let's go. And yeah. then it's, and then it flashes, uh, you know, it, it doesn't say a hundred years later, but it's 1872, the first scene, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then it goes a hundred years into the future and now we're in 72 and we're seeing the modern world of 72. And I'm like, oh, this is so cool. This is clever. Like we've had a lot of probably, I haven't watched the last three or four in the franchise with Lee, but it looked like they probably were in the 1800s kind of stuffy. Hey, what if we took, Chris Lee's Dracula and, and put him in 1972. That was a cool idea. And it we open cool with idea. a lot of like scenes that they, sh- they show the modern world and then they do nothing with Dracula in this movie. <laughs> well, that's, so that's sort of the, that's the interesting thing about it. Right. Because, um, you know, as I'm watching this thing, uh, all I could do is, is think, you know, this looks really familiar. <laughs> This looks really familiar. And I realized this is Tim Burton's Dark Shadows. Oh, Tim Burton, who I found a quote. He said it's one of his all time favorite movies is Dracula 80, 1972. Yep. And this is the he that he didn't remake Dark Shadows. He remade Dracula (laughs) 1972. (laughs) So that's what he did. I mean, and so that's why it's so tonally weird. Yeah. Um, Just like this film is tonally weird, right? Um, so sort of like, I don't know, have you seen, have you seen Rob Zombie's The Monsters yet? No, I have not heard good things, so I haven't been rushing I, I, to watch it. I, 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 so I love how, The Monsters, how, so I How was it? it? So. Like scale um, of one to ten. It, he didn't, it's just like Tim Burton. 
Tim Burton did not remake Dark Shadows. Mm -hmm. Rob Zombie remade Batman, 1966. That's oh, what for the monsters. Don't... Yeah, that's what that's what the monsters is. It's like mm -hmm. watching a not so well scripted <laughs> episode of Batman, the original Batman, because it's so campy and like weird like and they even do like grandpa monster even does the batusi yeah like that you know like <laughs> like the, and then he, don't they sing i got you babe bro yeah, sunny and Jerry. yeah i got you babe yeah <laughs> that, that that was in there too um just as just to help you like give you my opinion of rob zombies and monsters i didn't hate it okay I did not. I was going in with low expectations. I didn't hate it. I wanted to turn it off several times in that first 30, 40 minutes because it was boring okay. um, and so not well brave review here. scripted. Um, <laughs> but it got better okay. over the course of the film or else I just got used to the style. Um, there were one or two times when I laughed. Um, Dan Roebuck, uh, who, um, I don't know him personally, but I, I've, I've communicated with him and talked to him, uh, plays grandpa and, uh, or the count in this one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he, he does a fantastic job, like absolutely amazing. And, um, he, he channels Al Lewis through and through in this, in, in this, and it's just, Great. I would love I would love to watch, you know, a TV series with him like Grandpa Munster. I think it'd be really good. Um Jeff Daniel Phillips, who plays Herman, uh, he is uh he 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 never gets the laugh quite right. He never gets mm. Fred Quinn's laugh quite right. And every cast member seems to be like interpreting the humor a little differently. And so there's there's no cohesive vision from the cast into mm. bringing these jokes to life, even when the jokes are well written. Like it's just like everybody is just sort of like there's no comedic timing and there's like no comedic chemistry. I think there's chemistry amongst all the actors that Rob Zombie picked because they've all worked together in the past on past movies. And I think they could probably, you know, do a horror film or whatever you know they wanted to do and probably do it well but with comedy you need like really good comedic timing and that just needs to work and it just doesn't mm -hmm. throughout most of this film and also there just isn't enough of the monsters in this film like there's a lot of herman and lily but i mean herman and lily are not the monsters you know when you think about the monsters you have to have grandpa and herman together you have to have you know, Lily and, and and Herman and Grandpa, like you can't just have like two of them because it's just, it doesn't work as well. And this film focuses so much on Herman and Lily that um, without Grandpa, it's just not, it's not, it's not the monsters like as we know it. And it's like an episode of Batman, but it's really long and it's, um, it, 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 uh, I'm it's thinking. Very I'm, I'm, I'm trying to decide a, a movie I'm going to put on tonight. I don't think I'm going to watch that. Well, <laughs> as okay, if you turn it on in the background, like, if you're, like doing something, <laughs> doing laundry. Yeah, if you're doing something, I think it'd be a great movie because it's just it's, listen to it. Yeah, and 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 you and every now and then you'll catch something you know that's amusing or funny. It's a beautiful film. Like it's really, really beautiful looking. When I watched the trailer, I thought there was something wrong with this movie. Because the lighting, um, the lighting just looked really bad in the trailer, mm -hmm. and that's all been fixed for the final film. Like the depth, oh, okay, uh, and of the shots looked really bad too, and that's all been fixed. Like I didn't have any problem visually with the film, and I think it looks really good now. Um, they, I still believe that Rob Zombie wanted to film this thing in black and white because if you watch the trailer in black and white, it looks really good. Um, and it, the lighting looks like it was done for a black and white film. And uh, but uh, and then they, he, he says Universal wouldn't let him shoot in black and white. Well, guess what? Werewolf by Night, which comes out tomorrow on Disney Plus, was shot completely in black and white. Really? And I don't the, know this one. And all of the critics are giving this thing rave reviews. It's, it's a Disney Plus special. So it's like 
I don't know if it's like a movie or like a made for TV. I don't know what you call these. So you now. so you mean it dropped three weeks ago, Jonathan? Oh, Remember, that's it's, true. Uh, it's October twenty eighth right. today. That's right. It's October, <laughs> so it dropped. Well, it, dro- it dropped a few this. weeks ago. It dropped a few weeks ago, yeah. And so I don't know it, what the audience is going to think of it, but I know that uh, the critics are giving this thing rave reviews, and it was shot completely in black, almost oh, entirely in black and white. And it is supposed to channel like the Wolfman and Dracula and Frankenstein, all the universal monster films. And it's supposed to be like really good, um, according to all these critics that have watched this thing. So I'm sort of excited, but it just shows me that Universal has a problem because they wouldn't let Rob Zombie shoot the monsters in black and white. And I think it would have translated a lot better in black. There's nothing you could do about like the way he edited the film. Frankly, I think this was a rush job. I think that they should have taken like another few months, maybe another year to work on this film because I think you could have made it a lot better, but I'm sure that they didn't have the budget to do that. Um, Because the first like 30 minutes is so like, weird it's not the monsters it's like let's take a tour through rob zombies transylvania (laughs) so so my my limited knowledge of that project was i think it was meant to go to theaters and then they tested it or it started playing for some audience test audiences and they were not giving it high scores and that's why it premiered on netflix i heard it was supposed to be a theatrical movie and well, then it like it wasn't so, well liked, so they just threw it on Netflix. That's what I heard. So here's the thing: somebody that I know that is involved in the thing, and I'm not going to say who it is, mm-hmm. um, said that the plan all along was for it to go to streaming. And I mean, it came out of Universal 1441 or whatever is that home video division. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't like through Universal that was that was doing it. Uh, so they said that the plan was all along, but it was really weird. If it was supposed to go to streaming, why couldn't it be black and white? Who cared? I don't know. See, and that's what that's that's the weird thing. All of this mixed messaging surrounding this film, just the weird way things came out with about it. Like, I don't know. I personally think that it was just completely rushed. Um, and they or they went over time or something, because if you just how uneven the editing is in this film and how it's just not paced well at all. Like it's just it it shouldn't we should not be spending like 30 minutes waiting for Herman Munster to come alive in this film. Like we should not be doing that because it it starts to pick up once Herman (laughs) comes alive. That's when the movie starts to get watchable uh, in my opinion. And so it was, were you um, expecting it to be good? No, I went in, (laughs) I went in and I was, I didn't have, I had low, I guess I had low expectations for the movie. Um, and so I walked away and I was pleasantly surprised that I didn't hate it. Okay. I don't love it. That's not a good... <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not any worse than any of the Munsters projects that have come out since okay. the original series went off the air. Like So like if you like Munsters Revenge or Munster Go Home, Here Come the Munsters. Yeah, it's a movie. Here Come the Munsters. Uh, the Munsters Today. If you like those... those, those... The Munsters Go to Disneyland? That's not a movie. <laughs> it should so be. if you if you made it should be right. <laughs> they go they on the actually, haunted mansion. No, they go to Sea World. They the go monsters, to Sea World. I believe the monsters went to Sea World. The monsters yeah. go to Hawaii. <laughs> no, I think it was Sea World. I think they went to Sea World. I don't know. I'm going to check on that. I think it was Sea World. Here's though. the thing with the monsters and Rob Zombie. Rob Zombie made one great movie, The Devil's Rejects, in 2005. It made my top ten list of the year. I was like. This guy's a filmmaker. Like I liked House of the Thousand Corpses from 03. I liked it, but I didn't I didn't think it was anything special. But Devil's Rejects was really cool. And then he follows it up with one of my least favorite movies ever, the Halloween remake. Yeah. Which I just thought was a mess yeah. in every way and yeah. angered me more than almost any movie I've ever seen. So I haven't really been dazzled by zombie since like he made one i can't even remember the title of it now was it lords of salem there was one in the last seven eight years that i thought i watched it was on shutter and i watched it and i was okay but i just i've kind of lost faith in rob zombie until someone says oh his latest he's going back to what he did in devil's rejects and it's kind of like dark and dirty and really like if that one i'll watch but rob zombie doing the monsters would be 
nothing I'm interested in. So, <laughs> yeah, I I didn't watch it for Rob Zombie. I just watched yeah. it for the monsters, and it's um, it's not any worse than any of the other monsters projects that have. Come I would out, be but curious. None of what, them are uh, that yeah. great. I would be curious to see series. what Rob Zombie would do with like a modern adaptation of Dracula. Could be interesting. Like if he. It'd be, I'd be curious to see if he wanted to make it just like a straight remake of the Bella Lugosi or Horror of Dracula or if, or if he did something wildly different. I would be curious to see what he would do with that property. I, I'm okay. I'm okay with him not doing that. Because <laughs> I don't know. The directors, at least of the 80, 1972, his name is uh, Alan Gibson. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he he's not bringing much to this property. Like there's, in terms of how it looks how it's edited, how it's paced. Like, there's not a whole lot of directorial input here. Okay, did you enjoy 1972 or not? No. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Like, it has, uh, like, it, it, like it, it, Peter Cushing takes you through, you know, because he's always an interesting actor, and he's not in all of these. He wasn't no. in Prince of Darkness, right? Nope, nope. And he's great in Horror of Dracula. And so he, like, way more so than Christopher Lee, who's barely in AD 72, Peter Cushing makes the movie as interesting as it is, as watchable as it is. But I just kept thinking, and I try not to critique movies as what it could have been, but I'm like, so you have Christopher Lee as Dracula. You push things forward into the year 1972. You're not going to have most of the story be about him exploring the modern world like that would have been really cool instead would he it? just stays put in a castle would it would it it would have been better than what we got i don't know there's nothing I, of interest in this know. movie i i don't know because like, it opens with a good scene it opens with a good what three four minute opening chase scene yeah. uh battle scene to the death uh of dracula and then it jumps forward into 72 and i'm like Okay, you know, I, I looked up a lot of the reviews of this were negative, but I thought hey, this could be kind of fun. It'll be cheesy. It'll be kind of like a cult classic kind of a movie. It won't be great, but it'll be fun. And then we get into what is what? A 10 minute scene of them singing and dancing at that party. And I went, uh oh, yeah. <laughs> it was a little long but and, and then I'm it just not, never recovered after and, that you know that like, the character charles i don't even know how he fits into this <laughs> you know who i'm talking about yeah the guy who invited the band like oh yeah yeah like how does he even fit into this like i thought he was going to be some sort of player or something in this this movie and his family would you know involve themselves somehow but i don't know it was weird and then wasn't van helsing there so at the we, party we, I think so. Well, we have yeah, we have Van what? Helsing, and then we have his granddaughter, which in the script it was his daughter, but I read that Peter Cushing he looked so old when he got to set that they said there, no one's going to believe that that's her dad, so they made him her grandfather. <laughs> he uh, he had lost he lost his uh, wife uh, in the last year or two, so he had been going through some grief, and he. I guess it really took a toll on him physically because I guess he aged a lot in the year or two since he lost well, his he, wife. He we talked really about that last job year. In, that, in the prologue, though. Yeah. He, mm -hmm. he was very active and looked really good. Like that's true. Very healthy. Like I thought he <laughs> I thought he I thought he looked good for having gone through all of that, you know, in that prologue. How did he do? But I felt like in Prince of Darkness, Christopher Lee doesn't say anything. Did you read no. this? That he, yeah, he hated the he script. had dialogue and he, he said, it. I'm not saying this. <laughs> no. So he just hissed the whole time. So he just really hissed. easy paycheck. Still and then one we of my get to this movie. Movies, though. Still one of my favorite Dracula movies. No, though. I like that. I like that yeah. he was just kind of silent and deadly in the corner. And then in AD 72, he's talking and there's nothing of interest that he says. And oh, what no, would you say? One of the greatest lines a good line, in any good Dracula line? movie. Yeah. What is that? Uh, you would match your with will against mine. Uh, me who has commanded uh, armies oh, or, I have the or quote. something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the quote is, you would play your brains against mine, against me who has commanded nations. Yeah. Uh, this directly references Dracula's dialogue from Bram Stoker's novel, 
whilst they played wits against me, against me who commanded nations and intrigued for them and fought for them hundreds of years before they were born, I was countermining them. So he says a line in the movie that is kind of taken out of Stoker's novel. whoop de doo Well, I <laughs> thought it was great because this is the thing. I think Christopher Lee has been on record. I, I hope I'm not confusing him and putting words in his mouth. I think he went on record in some interview saying he never understood why these people that wrote these scripts did not just take the dialogue directly from Stoker's novel. And he just could not figure it out. Like for the life of him, he couldn't figure out why they didn't just steal the dialogue from the book because it was so much uh, better written than anything that they could possibly come up with. And, you know, this piece of dialogue referencing, which I think was a good piece of dialogue, which wasn't directly lit from the book, but it references the book. I think it was great. Like I, I loved this piece of dialogue and the fact that they stopped the music for him to deliver this line was really good. I didn't like the camera angle at which he delivered the line. It should have been a, <laughs> at least like a medium close up for his, this delivery mm -hmm. of this line. Uh, I, in my opinion, because it was such an important, impactful line, which in the whole scheme of the movie was just sort of thrown away um but uh it was um i like i was really happy when i heard that like that was like that that got my interest right there when i heard that line i'm like oh that's a good dracula line. well if unless they're remaking or, or making a new adaptation of the brand stoker novel why would we be using lines from his book in dracula movies that don't necessarily relate to the plot of the book they would just be, they would just well, be because they, they never used them. They never use them. <laughs> like if you're going to like because if if horror of Dracula, I think his point was if horror of Dracula actually had, you know. More dialogue from the book that Dracula spoke, then, you know, that would have been fine. You don't mm -hmm. use it again. Right. I mean, it's not like Star Wars where they just reuse the same dialogue over and over again. But um Oh, you better be careful. <laughs> I love that though. I love that as a as a as a Star Wars fan. I love hearing okay. the lines that I heard in a film that I watched when I was five on a TV show that is in the present day. I do enjoy that. It's a great throwback. It it makes all the feels. I'm not critiquing it. Okay, don't send me hate mail. I love that. Okay, but um, I don't think I they know where to things. find you. <laughs> That's uh, that is the point, Brian. All right. So, um, yeah. So I don't know what I was saying. because <laughs> I started ranting about something. Oh, yeah. So you want you wanted yeah. his dialogue so, from the novel to be yeah, in because, more of so, the Dracula. They hadn't used it. They hadn't used it in any other of the movies. So they didn't use it in horror. They didn't use it in Prince of Darkness. So, like, use it at some point, I think, is what he was just basically begging the script writers to do. Just use the dialogue that Stoker wrote and they never use the dialogue that Stoker wrote and it just infuriated him. Maybe they're in the Coppola movie from 92 Bram Stoker's Dracula. Maybe there's more of the dialogue. Well, there. there is, there is the fantastic line that is not from the novel in that, that film, which of course is why Gary Oldman took the role of Dracula in the first place. Mm. Uh, you know, that, that line, I have crossed oceans of time to find you. Oh. That particular line is it should have been in the book, wasn't in the book. Uh, so I mean that was a, a really um, great line. Like there's a lot of really great Dracula dialogue um, that comes from movies, and that isn't in the book. Mm. But I think because Hammer's script writing department was so deficient and just absolutely infuriating to Christopher Lee, he was just like, "Would you please just lift from the book? It is so much better." <laughs> than anything you can come up with and they just didn't listen to him so i think that was that was kind of his point but what changed uh, between 66 and 72 what changed between him and 66 saying you wrote me dialogue i'm not going to say any of it to 72 he's now played the character like seven times and he is saying the dialogue if he doesn't like it anymore he just gave up he was like whatever it's a paycheck I'll say what I they need me to say. I, I can't speak to him like personally, like <laughs> what changed, but I know that he did not like the dialogue in Prince of Darkness. He absolutely refused to say any of it. He thought it was rubbish. Um, and so maybe the dialogue was a little better in the, the follow-up films, you know, kind of maybe met his standard. I haven't read the script uh, uh, for Prince of Darkness. I don't know what Dracula's dialogue was supposed to have been, <laughs> but, 
but apparently it did not please uh, Sir Christopher Lee. So. Like, does he have an autobiography? I would love to read the chapter about the Dracula films and like what why did he make so many was it just the money more than a chapter he should have more than a chapter on the dracula films i mean it was like what was that like he so he did third of his career third of his career well so he 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 plays the role for the first time in 58 and then there's one more after 72 right Mm -hmm. yeah what's it called it's called uh the satanic rites of dracula in 73 have you seen that one Mm mm-hmm and that's the last time he plays Dracula. Yeah, I is that right? So. Well, he play okay. He plays Dracula in the Spanish version of Dracula. Oh, okay. Have you? What, what year is that? And that actually that... uses all of Stoker's dialogue. Oh, okay. He's got the mustache in this one. I thought I thought I read that the last one he made was the one right after this. So there's well, a, it a, wasn't a Spanish a production film. he's in. It wasn't a Hammer film. It oh, okay. wasn't a Hammer film. It's a Spanish production uh, where he plays Dracula. Um, and I have not seen this movie, but I hear really great things about it. Like it's super true to the book. So I don't know how that's going to make a great movie because the book's kind of boring. But um, <laughs> in all honesty, but uh, I think that uh, it would be interesting to watch. It's supposed to be the most faithful adaptation of Stoker's novel on the screen. So... Yeah, so I guess he did make one or two outside of Hammer because it says he technically played Count Dracula in 10 films, nine if his uncredited role in the comedy One More Time is excluded. And then, yeah, so it looks like he might have made one or two more after Satanic, like maybe in the like later in the 70s. I'm just trying to see if I can find... Chris, oh, here we go. Christopher Lee, Dracula Wiki. So his first interpretation of the character is in 58. And let me just read the titles real quick. So these are all the Dracula movies he did. Uh, So Horror of Dracula, 1958. Dracula, Prince of Darkness, 1966. Dracula Has Risen from the Grave, 1968. Taste the Blood of Dracula, 1969. Count Dracula, that's 1970, it. which is so not a Hammer film. No, that's it. It was Count Dracula. That's Scars, Scars of Dracula, 1970. Dracula AD, 1972. The Satanic Rites of Dracula, 1973. Retitled Count Dracula and His Vampire Bride in the United States. And then one more non-Hammer film called Dracula and Son, 1974. Yeah. So it was Count Dracula is that that movie I haven't seen yet, uh, but it, it I hear really good things about it. So the one that is a Spanish production is Count Dracula. Yeah. So but like he goes from for eight years, he doesn't play Dracula. He comes back for Prince of Darkness. He's not in that movie very much. Well, he plays. Let's see. He plays the mummy. He plays the Frankenstein monster. Okay, so I'm just I'm just talking about Dracula interpretations from him. Mm-hmm. It's eight years, and then over the course of the next six seven years, it's like he's just playing the guy all over the place. Yeah, and I can't imagine that must have been very interesting to him as an actor. He's just playing the same guy over and over and over, and and they're usually like small roles. It's not like he's the the lead. I mean, maybe he is of a couple of these sequels I didn't watch. Have you seen the all of them? I I don't think I've seen all of them. But I've I've seen a number of them. And, you know, outside after Prince of Darkness, it gets kind of fuzzy for me because like (laughs) I just see these I see these scenes in my head. Like there's this one scene with this lady, like I think falling out of a chimney or or something like that. Like it is really like horrifying. Like and so they're just in my head, but I can't um, describe to you which movies in particular that they came from. Um, And he just like dies at the end of every one. (laughs) You have to kill Dracula. Yeah. So, you know, there's a happy ending. There has to be. I mean, it's not like, it's not like, you know, all these people watching Dahmer, they're like, we want a happy ending. Well, you're not going to get a happy ending. Ooh, I'm halfway through. Don't, don't, I mean, don't spoil. I know how it ends. I've read the story about (laughs) the guy, but uh, I don't know much about like the trial. Like, I guess a couple episodes are about the trial. I don't really know much about that part of it. So I'm excited, but. I think that show, it's not an enjoyable show, but it's very well done. Are you watching Dahmer? 
I finished it. Yeah, I thought it. I thought it was enjoyable. You thought I thought, I thought it was enjoyable. I, I wouldn't I use the word enjoyable. One of the best pieces of television, like. It's, in a long, it's long fascinating, time. and Evan it's Peters really, is incredible. Oh my god, he is! Isn't he amazing? Like he is so amazing. Like he's I so just, I creepy. can't, I can't get over. I cannot get over. He does such a good job. But he's a super versatile actor. Um, you know, going back to American yeah. Horror Story, all of the different characters he has played. I have always liked. I never liked him. I didn't like him in season one of American Horror Story all that much. Mm. But like every like season going forward, I just I I thought he was just absolutely phenomenal and just like the highlight of that series. Uh, and uh, his portrayal of Dahmer is just like amazing. Like he is so fantastic in this thing. And, you know, you don't really want to watch this and, and, and like, like the character. Right. But he makes this, he makes Dahmer very sympathetic. Like he does this, really excellent job of like doing that um for the audience and it's um it's it's unnerving that he's able to do that you know but i guess the 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 person in real life uh, was able to do that with the strange people in the country too um through the things that he did and all the other media coverage and stuff like that. And you'll see that later on in the series. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I, I wouldn't say, I, you know, I'm watching Dahmer thinking, oh, I understand him now. <laughs> it's like, I'm not, like yeah, what no, he no. did was horrific. Nobody, under no, nobody no, I'm not him. like, oh, yeah. but but I do think it's, it's, you know, it's an important piece of, you know, our tragic history with this guy that I think it, that story needed to be told and the way it's being told and the long form narrative on Netflix I don't think we need to tell the story again after this. I think this is it. But I, I really I do, well done. I do feel like this story needed to be told in the way it's in, in the way it's being told, and really giving you know spotlight to a lot of the victims and mm -hmm. telling us who they were. I think it's important too. I really like his neighbor a lot. I yeah, really, really like his neighbor. <laughs> uh, apparently, in real life, she didn't live next right next door to him. Oh uh, well, um, but uh, yeah. So I mean that 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 is just a phenomenal show like i and like it's so a lot better than dracula 80 1972 <laughs> don't put it down but i mean some yeah, things like, have gotten better i in I the last 50 interested. years i would be very interested in in seeing you know what happens to evan peters in his career after this like some people have compared him to johnny depp in terms of his versatility and you know able to bring characters to I life i don't know if we that's necessarily the person we that uh, Evan Peters would want to be compared to, but well, I know, but I mean, like, in, in thinking about like the, all the different characters that he's played, and you know, just the ability to bring those folks to life, um, I think it was an interesting comparison, and uh, I, I'm just excited for his career because I think a lot of people that didn't know that he was such a great actor, they're now discovering know a, him yeah, here. Now know yeah. that he's a great actor, and they're discovering him. Uh, and I, so I'm very happy for him. Like, I think it's, 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 it's really good. Yeah. But, uh, going back to Dracula, do you, you don't agree with me that you think it should have been more about Dracula, like stepping into the modern world, at least a little bit like he does. Does he ever leave that castle? Well, okay. So there's <laughs> two schools of thought here. Okay. So the first school of thought is you can do it like dark shadows did it the original mm -hmm. Dark Shadows, where Barnabas just sort of adapts to yeah. the world around him. He's functioning in the world, going out to eat, you know, all of these other things, right? He's just gotten used to it. And you don't necessarily show any of that fish out of water, like stuff, like, you know, Hocus Pocus with the witches, they show all the, the fish out of water, like I'm getting used to modern Salem, right? And so you don't necessarily see that, um, in dark shadows and i think that was well done mm -hmm. i think i don't think we need to see that stuff then you do tim burton with his take on dark shadows and barnabas is just like you know standing on the asphalt and it's like he's thinking it's really weird and you know the, and they they play up that comedic aspect i mean christopher lee with dracula he's not okay he's not barnabas because barnabas is this suave sophisticated gentleman right and so jonathan frid you know he he has to interact with society mm -hmm. and he's not you know tim burton johnny depp barnabas where he's just sort of like goofy and sort of crazy and he's like doing all of these weird things i mean he's 
Christopher Lee's Dracula. He's a stoic figure. He is an he's a figure that has a lot of power and a lot of rage and violence. Um and so I don't necessarily know what we could gain <laughs> by seeing Dracula leave. I mean, at least in the hands of this particular scriptwriter and director, what we could gain from that. So I think that this was a entertainment. <laughs> no. Because I think it I think it, it it does a good job of maintaining um You didn't want to see Christopher Lee walk into that dance party and he just starts like rocking out. You didn't want to see that? No. <laughs> no, I didn't. So I think it does a good job of maintaining like the respect for the character. Like, you know, not necessarily making him it's the seventh that he one. Isn't. <laughs> we could have some fun with it, right? I don't I'm not, know. I'm not talking he has I to dance, but like I don't think any people I don't really think people were quite prepared for anything that you had in mind. The Brian, fish out of water story would have been fun. No, like him, not him in, like interacting not in with Dracula. 72 no. people. No. No. <laughs> why not? I mean, and when you think it would why you, put it in 72? Then why even set it in the modern day in, in when this was made? Why, who different. cares? To do something Just different. Just do the and same thing again. That's apparently what you as want. A, as a marketing. <laughs> well, of course. Just do I the mean, same movie again. I'm like, no, like, let's do something different. Just like Star Wars. So like anyway, Star, Wars. <laughs> I mean, Star Wars fans know what they like. Like you would have like been happy thing. if Dracula 8072 had just been like a shot for shot remake of Prince of Darkness. Yes, it would have been entertaining. It would have been quality. It would have been good. And I'm like, um, but, okay, but I, you're on the seventh I, one. Let's just have enjoyed, fun with it. Let's I, enjoyed, do something different. I enjoyed the movie. I enjoyed the movie, though. Like, the way it was, I enjoyed the movie. I, I didn't think it was a great movie, but I, I had fun with it. Like, it was, it kept me watching. It kept me interested. Like, I was never bored. What, was where fun. was the tension in AD 72? There, there wasn't necessarily... There's not really much to, like, tension, get but, you excited or make but you want the, to keep watching i think that the characters were interesting they okay. weren't like well-written characters but they were interesting <laughs> enough so like you've got um johnny alucard right and this obviously is not the first time that they used alucard as as a name for uh a dracula servant or dracula himself i mean that started with son of dracula back with lon chaney in the 40s Mm -hmm. um so but i mean you know it was it was kind of nice to see the name brought back mike this is my question brian and i want to know if you have an answer okay so i'm going to ask you something my question is <laughs> is johnny alucard that we see in 1972 the same character who collected dracula's ashes in 1872 well it can't be like the I, like the P Peter Cushing Van Helsing we see in seventy nineteen seventy two, I I imagine was just a descendant of the yeah, character. Yeah, he, he was the descendant. Yeah, and they made that clear. Just happened to look exactly the same. Yeah. And but, then he has a granddaughter. Yeah. And but you're Johnny telling me Alicard, this other character just what just didn't age a hundred in a, in a hundred years? That's what I'm trying to figure out. He's I like, have been I have been trying to figure this out ever since I watched this movie. <laughs> but he's not because he begs Dracula for immortality. Oh. And that was one of the very confusing things about this because I'm like, is he the same person? Because if he's not the same person, why is he still doing this stuff? Mm. But I, I would assume he's the same person. I think he's the same person, but he, for some reason he got, how is he the same person? Like, that's what I'd like to know. Like, because he hasn't obviously been turned into a vampire yet because he gets turned into a vampire by Dracula in this movie. So that was one of the weird things about this film. Like that was one of the questions that I had. Um, unless he just through some satanic ritual has maintained his youth or something. I don't really know. Um, that, that part was interesting. Uh, the, you know, the, the black mass or whatever I thought was an interesting way to bring Dracula back to life. I don't think that the way it was done, like was particularly good, but I thought the idea behind it was interesting. And I think that if there had been some sort of ritualistic sacrifice in this particular scene, um, it would have been much more uh, interesting. 
you know, sort of like they did with uh, Prince of Darkness. And maybe instead of just sacrificing uh, one person to bring Dracula to life now, since it's 1972, and they only have some of his ashes, they have to sacrifice the whole group. Um, I thought that might have been a, an interesting way of going of, about it. And so there was some tension for me when they all went into that church because I'm like, well, is, is he going to have to kill all these people to bring Dracula to life? And then he just like didn't kill anybody. Does does it disappoint you when you watch these Dracula sequels when Dracula is barely in the movie? That doesn't no, bother you. No, because I'm used to it. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm used to it with Hammer films. Like I'm very used to. It. It's not like um, he's in a lot of horror of Dracula, and that's a reason why that movie is so good. But, he, but he's not though. He's not in the fir- in the first not. one. No, he doesn't have a lot of screen time in horror of Dracula. Boy, he you feel his presence you if he's not in a presence. lot of it. Yeah, but he's not in much of the movie. Like, I mean, he's in the beginning, right? He, he's he's in, like... A little bit. Chunks he, of he it. He comes down the stairs. I mean, count the number of lines he, of dialogue he actually has in that film. I think, like, hmm. you can count them, like, on one hand. Maybe that's I why think. Christopher Lee liked to play him so much, because he could probably shoot his whole part in, like, a day. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and he gets star billing. Star billing, poster, his face is on the poster, and he's like, I worked last year <laughs> for three days. One on uh, Count Dracula, one on Scars of Dracula, and then there I am. It's it's almost as good of a gig as hosting a game show, so. Yeah. Yeah, Wheel of Fortune, right? They work like one week out of the month, something like that. Yeah. And they have the rest of the the month off. Yep. (laughs) I like it. Yeah, we should do that, Brian. We should take (laughs) jobs like that and get paid millions of dollars. So let's see. So the film was shot in 71. I'm assuming that Christopher Lee worked for more than a day, but he's not in this very much. I feel like Peter Cushing had a lot more days of shooting for this. Yeah. Peter Cushing. It's funny. Always I, I Like I watch these guys and my first thought is always Halloween because John Carpenter famously went to Christopher Lee to play uh, Sam, Loomis. Sam Loomis. And then when he said no, he went to Peter Cushing. And then the third person they went to was Donald Pleasance. And when I think of Halloween, I always like, when I think of that character, I think that could have been Christopher Lee. And then you watch these Dracula movies and he's got such a tall, like big presence. And I'm like, he would have been wrong for that character in Halloween. That would have take, that would take us out of the movie if that was Christopher Lee. So Honest, I, it worked, it worked out. Honestly, Donald Pleasance is that character. He was I don't perfect. Think, I don't think you can ever replace him. Um, they've tried, you know, with obviously Rob Zombie's effort and an H two O with the voiceover, and it just didn't work. Like it's it's just it's just <laughs> and in Halloween it Kills work. Did you see yeah. Halloween Kills? He's yeah. that yeah. They they had like a stand in. They had like yeah, a, a look alike actor at the beginning. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they that he looked pretty close, but yeah, he, it's not him. <laughs> yeah, tell. but um, yeah, and I guess uh, Donald Pleasance ran into Christopher Lee years later. And Christopher Lee said to Donald Pleasance, or no, maybe he, uh, maybe Christopher Lee said this to John Carpenter and, and Deborah Hill later said, that was the biggest mistake I've ever made in my career was saying no to Halloween. That would have given me a new career in horror films. It would but, have. I mean, it makes sense. Like when you think of like what Halloween was being pitched as before it got made, you could be like, who are, who's this director? What is this movie? Babysitter murders? Like, no. Like, I, 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 like, I think it'd be a hard one to pitch and make it sound good. So, I, I don't, I don't been feel as successful with Christopher Lee, though. I mean, we'll never know. Maybe we that won't. timeline is in a different universe <laughs> that we may or may not ever see. I don't know. I, I just, I, I in my opinion, Peter Cushing would have been Donald, okay. In my opinion, Donald Pleasance makes, but Donald Pleasance so. Because he's he, he doesn't feel like an actor. Crazy. No, he <laughs> himself is crazy. Like he's crazy, just like Michael Myers is crazy, but he's crazy in a different way. And I'm not sure if either um, Lee or Cushing could bring that same level of insanity into the role of Doctor Loomis. Yeah. and which is, I, I, it is a really difficult thing to do, and he pulls it off like absolutely brilliantly. So, but he brought you know, so much you of see... himself to that role. Too. You, like you that see, wasn't in the script. Yeah. But still, you see Christopher Lee play Count Dracula in sequel after sequel after sequel after sequel. I, I don't think he cared that much about the script. I think he was an actor who just took gigs for the money 
and maybe would make one here and there that he believed in. Like The Wicker Man's a great movie. That's next year, yeah. 73. But, That's his uh, favorite film, I believe. That's his that he made, film. Yeah. that he was in. Yeah, The Wicker Man's great. I watched that once 10 years ago, maybe more, and I still I can still like see many, many segments of that movie in my head. Mm-hmm. But uh, like, I wonder why he wouldn't have taken a chance on a young director and a horror film in Halloween. If he had seen Assault on Precinct 13, which had come out before but in 76, like there's clearly talent there. Like, I, I, I'm curious, like how many movies that guy said yes to in his long career and he said no to Halloween. It's like, well, okay, good job. <laughs> what, what, what did Donald Pleasant say? Donald Pleasant said something about Halloween while they were shooting it. Um, he, he had no interest in Halloween. His yeah. daughter was in a rock band, I think, and his daughter liked the music in Assault on Precinct 13. Yeah, that was he it. He said to Carpenter, that's why I'm here. Because my daughter likes your music. Yeah. I don't understand the script. I don't yes. really understand this part, but yeah. I'm here. Yeah. And he shot his whole role in five days. So mm-hmm. it wasn't a big time commitment. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it's... Little it's did absolutely... he know what was going to come of that. That's his I most know. famous <laughs> role in his whole career. His most famous role. And, you know, that's why I like that, uh, the original Halloween timeline with Halloween, Halloween 2, uh, and then 4, Four five, and 5, and 6. And six. Because I mean, you can it's really him. see that he's 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 starting. He gets it. There, there's just a point where he just he gets it, and he just like takes it like. Yeah, by be. four, like he is like the show. He's like the yep. star of four. That's right. Yep. He makes that movie great. Yep. Because he's he's just like on a another level of crazy. It's just like I, I, gotta, I gotta find him. Gotta <laughs> find Michael. And then uh, I've always it always disappoints me that he didn't live long enough to be an H two O. Like that would have been really cool yeah. if he had lived long enough to have even a scene or two with Jamie Lee again. And he comes back like that would have been amazing. But he yeah. passed away. It would have been in cool 95. Have, like, him passing the baton to her, like a scene where, where he was able to do that. You know, they probably would have. Yeah, they probably would have killed Loomis in H2O if he was still yeah. alive. They probably would have killed him. But um, so maybe that would we never he never actually. Died. I mean, he died at the end of two. Yeah, he, he but got not blown really. Up. And then in Halloween four, he just got a little scar. He's okay. It's like, oh right. <laughs> like, don't think too much about that one. But I, I mean, that's I part of the fun of these movies, the end, right? I still don't know what happens at the end of six. Like, I don't know what. <laughs> have you seen the producers the cut? I have. That's like a completely different movie. It's so I bizarre. I, I don't really like the producers cut, but it's like just this interesting. Like asterisks. It's like that was the one that, that was that was the version I watched first. Oh. And then I watched the the regular cut. I was like, this is so different. Like this is not what I remember at all. I so, paid a lot of money. I remember not a lot, but it was like 60, 70 bucks or something when I was in high school. And I bought the producer's cut on eBay. Oh. And I watched it on VHS in a really poor quality, but I was I'm I've always been such a huge Halloween fan that i'm like i have to see this i mean i've heard it's not it's not like one or two scenes it's like a completely different experience yeah. and it is it's not yeah. good but it's it, but it, uh in 2014 they brought out the scream factory box set and they remastered the producer's cut so it looks really good and yeah so i'm happy i that watched exists. i watched a bootleg too so i'm glad we both got the bootleg producer's cut experience but it's especially for fans of donald pleasance like the the last scene of the producer's cut is cool because then the theatrical cut he just says, I have some business to take care of here. You hear him scream like on a shot of a pumpkin. And then it just cuts to credits in the producer's cut. We get one more scene of him. And he yeah. is now like the chosen one with the mark of thorn. Yeah. And he's like, what? And he starts screaming and it's kind of silly, but it's cool. Like, I mean, this guy passed away months before Halloween six opened that there's like new scenes with him that never got released that's also what made it kind of special so yeah but i don't think there's an alternate cut of dracula 80 1972 i don't think so i think they just i'm not sure what would be in it. i can see the editor jonathan looking at this i'm like okay i guess i gotta put this together in some way (laughs) i just don't see a lot of passion at this point the opening montage like the cut from 1872 to 1972 that was good great like i was really excited about it like I was really excited at that point. It and opens we just, well. 
Yeah. And then we spent so long at that party. And I was just like, "Mm." we're, I mean, there's like 10 close ups of the same three people singing. It like keeps cutting back to them and then back again and then back. I'm like, what does this have to do with anything? (laughs) Get on with that movie. And it didn't. I'm like, oh, because they have to get to 90 minutes. That's why it's I thought the song was okay. I thought the songs they sang were okay. Let's talk about the music. We haven't talked about the music yet. Yes. Uh, So it starts off with the Warner Brothers logo with um, the classic Dracula theme. Dun, dun, dun. Starts off. Yeah. Bum, bum. But then it never appears again in the film. Mm -hmm. I was, I have to say, I liked the, 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 I liked the music um of the this more serious music in the in the film when dracula was resurrected and stuff like that but i was really expecting to hear that classic hammer dracula theme when we first saw dracula mm. in 1972 and we didn't i thought the music that was done for it was good but i was really expecting to hear the theme and i didn't hear the theme at any point in this movie it just was at the beginning uh on the warner brothers logo and that was it I mean, it makes sense. We're moving forward in 1972 that the music would have a little bit more of a funky quality. It wouldn't just sound like the old fashioned. But we get to some scenes of action in the last half hour, and the music is still sounding like it's out of 1972. And I'm like, there were a couple moments where it's supposed to be intense and scary and action packed. And I'm sitting there going, this sounds like it's out of Austin Powers. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, it was like there was a lot of like in the early parts where Dracula's in the cathedral and all that other stuff. I thought the music was really well done, but then mm-hmm. as you get towards the end, it's just sort of like, why are, do we still have this backbeat on mm-hmm. the music right now? Like it's <laughs> like, please, yeah. no, yeah. So I mean, it, like it was different, I guess, but I mean, partly I just didn't really connect with any of the characters or the story, or I was like, well, okay, what are we doing with this? new entry like what's what's of interest to me and they didn't really they they set up like something cool and different was going to take place and then it never really does and so at about the hour mark i'm like okay i'm just gonna i'm really just watching this now for peter cushing because he is just always an interesting actor i like watching him and stuff so he made it worth watching it to the end but this is definitely the least of the four i watched and i didn't really like brides of dracula that much mainly because there is no dracula and it was kind of slow. Like for me, it was horror of Dracula, like a solid eight out of 10, maybe even higher. And then Dracula, Prince of Darkness was like 6.5. <laughs> Brides was like 5.5, 6. And then this is more like three or four out of 10. Like, it's just kind of like, what are we doing here? This yeah, is a, I... It's a money grab, Jonathan. That's all this movie is. <laughs> no, I like some of those uh, church scenes. I really like some of those church scenes. Some of the Dracula's production designs are okay. like, yeah, mm-hmm. like it, it, he's walking around in this abandoned church. It's really spooky. I mean, it, it, it just uh, I, I so I, I enjoy like I said, I enjoyed the film. Like I thought I thought it was interesting about the, the vampire in the shower. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> Oh yeah, and he like doesn't he like rip off the curtain like as he's as he's falling over he like rips the curtain off and he's like ah yeah I mean it was it was interesting um, because Hammer made up these interesting rules for vampires a they don't turn into bats because we don't mm. have the money for that yeah but b they can uh, they can't cross running water right and now all of a sudden they die in running water. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it was Hammer definitely rewrote the rules for their um, creativity <laughs> and budget purposes. Um, but uh, I think I actually watched, I don't know if it was any good or not. I think a fan actually created a scene where Christopher Lee turns into a bat oh. using Dracula um, walking in the church from this 1972 film. And I don't remember if it was if it was a good transformation or not, but I remember uh, this particular uh, fan edit, and I thought, well, that's a really cool concept. I would have loved Dracula to turn into a bat in the Hammer films. Like that just would have been nice to see, you know. Instead of uh, Peter Cushing, very early on, I got so mad at Peter Cushing when he said that in the first Dracula film. It's like Dracula cannot change into a bat. Oh, okay. Too many special effects. Yes, we don't have right. we don't have the budget. I think part right. I think part of the problem with AD 72 is that you could tell like they just didn't have a lot of budget so they couldn't probably do a lot of the things that they wanted to do. It felt like okay, we just have to keep 
Dracula here and we're not going to let him explore. <laughs> no, you don't want to see that, but I wanted it. Um, I mean, I would be okay, but okay. But when you think of the character of Dracula, he's, he's walking already, around. But no, he's already done that though. He did that in Dracula because he went from Transylvania or Carpathia in the Hammer series to um, England. And that is a totally different world. I know that is not a totally different century, but it might as well be going from the 1400s to going to the 1800s. Like, couldn't you have seen him slip onto an airplane and he's like, what is the, like, there could have been some humor, some, like, some interesting, (laughs) like just the airplane. But no, but Dracula does that in the original 1927 stage play. That's how he gets to London. He takes, okay. Yeah. So he's like, it's, so it's interesting. Um, because he's lived through all of these centuries anyway, so he's seen all of these changes, and so he's kind of used to things. Um, he so he could have walked into like a fast food. Right? He could have walked into a gay bar and kind of was like doing like that. Would I would have liked that? That's fine. <laughs> I know, but uh, I don't think there's because with Dracula, he's lived through all this time anyway. He's seen all of this change. I mean, you think about people that are like ninety, a hundred years old, and you hear people like, "Oh my God, they have experienced so much change in their life." Well, think of poor Dracula. You know, he went from, you know, the only entertainment he had was like staking people on his front lawn to now, you know, living in the 20th century and, you know, having cars honk their horns. I mean, you know, he's seen it all. So I don't know what more you want to see. So it's not in this other movie's title, but for me, like the more modern take on a Dracula story of a film made in 72 is Blackula. Have you seen Blackula? Yeah. Like that, that character kind of moves in and out of modern day society, circa 72. And a lot more interesting things happen in that story. The scenes of violence are very striking and they feel more of its day. Yeah. So I, I think the, the vampire movie to see of 72 is Blackula. That's oh, more yeah. entertaining Definitely. and interesting yeah. all the way through with yeah. the characters Definitely. and there's a scene there's one scene towards the beginning that was really frightening of 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 uh, the vampire coming up to this woman she's like she's like uh, developing film and it's all red and then the vampire strikes and that's a great scene like it had some it wasn't a great movie but it had some really terrific scenes in it and mm-hmm. i liked it a lot and it kept my interest all the way through and that was not the case with this one <laughs> i think you're just an easy critic jonathan uh, no, I'm not. I don't think you've ever disliked anything we've talked about in two years on this podcast. Well, that's because we <laughs> don't talk about rom-coms. <laughs> we don't talk we don't, about rom-coms. And we don't talk about the things that I don't talk about. I mean, <laughs> if you sat me down and made me watch, I don't know, just name some movie, like some random movie, like I would just like tear it apart. You wouldn't like, have liked, it, uh, we just talked about The Emigrants, which is a three and a half hour foreign drama. You wouldn't have liked that? Well, I don't know. Was it well done? It was great. Okay, and it well, was... I probably would have liked it. Anyway, okay. <laughs> but like, if you just like... if you Okay, if you gave me a film of the caliber of Dracula 1972 that wasn't a monster movie, that wasn't yeah. a horror film, I would not like it, Brian. But because it's horror, it, it gets a pass. If I asked you to come on and talk about a romantic comedy, no matter oh. how great it was... You I would. I, do, I don't know. No, if it was good. Okay. <laughs> no, but what I'm what I'm saying is like you go into the, all these films and you look at the films and you're like, oh, Dracula 1972 did not keep my interest. La 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 la. And I go into it and like Dracula 1972 has kept my interest because it's got Dracula. You know. So that's, that's my weakness. That's my weakness. I know, but you just wait for him to come out, and then when he comes out, he's got so much presence. It'd be so like what? It'd be like there. it'd be like I go to see Halloween ends in a few days, and Michael Myers was in like ten minutes of the whole movie. Well, we're not going to, we're not going to, I won't spoil that for you then. So, uh, well, you've seen it. You haven't seen it. <laughs> no. I okay. It. No, but it, the theories that are out there, you know, okay. I, 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 I'm like, I'm so scared of it being spoiled. Like I'm going to just yes, like, it's the first time I don't want to spoil either. The first so. time it's playing is a 5 PM at my local theater on Thursday, the 13th, Yeah. which would have been two weeks ago. <laughs> and, uh, I'm just going to go because I don't want it to be spoiled. I don't want to know yeah. anything. 
I haven't exactly. even watched. There's a new trailer came out like a week. I didn't even watch it. I'm like, I don't want to I see watched, it. I watched the new trailer. <laughs> I don't even want to see I, it. <laughs> I, I love the new trailer. And okay, was, good. I thought the first trailer was good, but I thought this trailer I saw was there was a TV spot that played yesterday I've that I just couple, couldn't avoid. I watched a couple TV spots, and I think all of them have been really good, too. Yeah. And she said something like, uh, maybe I have to die. To, yeah, for him to die, and I she went, "Oh, that. don't give it away! Don't tell me! Don't tell me!" I don't know what's going to happen, but we'll see. Um, so a few other things about Dracula eighty seventy two. Uh, it was marketed with the tagline "Past, Present, or Future." Never count out the counts. And another tagline was "Welcome back, Drac." Yeah. Welcome back, Drac, and it's Welcome not back, like Drac. more tongue in cheek kind of humorous. It's still like dead serious. Like, come on. Welcome back, Drac. Uh, so what do you make of this? When it was released in the, in the U.S., a brief clip was played before the film in which actor Barry Atwater from The Night Stalker rises from a coffin and swears the entire audience in as members of the Count Dracula Society. I think that we need to have more advertising <laughs> and marketing like that in film and television today. Because that was fun stuff. That was, you know, that's things that people would remember, you know, and there's just not a lot of that creative marketing and advertising anymore. So like I before think the movie, like they're yeah, in the I theater. I know it's cool. Right. So I think that um, we just we've lost all creativity as far as marketing goes. Like we're just like, oh, just put it on the phone, push out an app like, the like they, don't, they don't have to get creative anymore. They don't have to do things like like that. And I think that's fun. Like the closest thing we've had to that in the theater itself was Tom Cruise before Top Gun Maverick started. There was a little clip of him saying, thanks for coming to the theater and watching this in a theater. I guess yeah, the closest it's thing. The same we've thing. Had. It's not the same thing. Um, so, yeah, so uh, some some creative taglines there. Critical reaction to the movie was not great. Roger Ebert gave it one star out of four. I'm with you there, Raj. While Clyde Jeevens of the Monthly Film Bulletin called it an abortive and completely unimaginative attempt to update the Bram Stoker legend to present day. In his 2017 book about vampire films of the 70s, author Gary Smith said, what seemed like a terrible idea back in 1972 really isn't so after all. Now it's so far removed from its contemporary setting, the swinging London uh, of Dracula AD 1972 seems as much a period piece as the Victorian settings of its I agree. predecessor. I agree. I agree with that. You're kind of you're kind of in that uh, I, kind of in I that agree. thing. That's kind of what we were talking about at the beginning. Like I, if we watch it in 1972, would I still feel the same way about it? I don't know. But like as an interesting, you know, what the scriptwriters thought 1972 was like in 1972, I think it's a fascinating piece. Mm -hmm. So there, yeah, there's that thinking. And I, yeah, I mean, don't watch this now and think, oh, this is modern day. <laughs> like it, yeah. it feels like an artifact of our past. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have that anymore. I, I'd be curious to know what was what was it like for audience members to go see this opening weekend in November of 72? I just can't imagine there was a lot of excitement in the theater. They were like, eh. <laughs> i don't know like it was it was dracula so they were just it wanted to go see it. yeah <laughs> and then um despite its generally mixed reception it the film has its admirers american film director tim burton at one point claimed it to be among his favorite films and english author film critic uh, Kim Newman chose it as one of his top 10 favorite vampire movies of all time what vampire yeah. movies have you seen, Kim Newman? <laughs> well, I this mean, is one of the best. <laughs> it's I it's it. If that's the thing about this movie. It's like I wouldn't say it's bad. It's it it definitely has a certain appeal. It has a certain appeal. <laughs> like it has a certain appeal. You, it, there has to be something done with it, though. It There's has nothing more, this movie it has, does. It has more appeal than Rob Zombie's The Monsters, Brian. <laughs> that's, that's you're setting a low bar <laughs> like it has more appeal and that i just had a much like larger budget. You, you you feel like they're reaching the end of their road i'm happy that there's just really one more 
Well, they wanted to just try. I mean, Hammer what was dying as a studio at that yeah. particular point, right? So they wanted to try and revive the brand. They wanted to, you know, infuse new blood into the character, and they were trying everything. I mean, Hammer really did try everything. Like if you think about the studio and the history of the films that they made, there's not anything that they didn't try. And so you got to give them props for that because when you watch a Hammer movie, it's not like watching a Universal movie. Like you're 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 going in and you know that things are going to be like crazy. Mm-hmm. Like it's just going to be anything is <laughs> anything is fair game in a Hammer film, right? But uh, when you watch a, a Universal film, especially the Universal films of the 30s, you're expecting you know a higher caliber of like and certain restrictions and things like that. And uh, it's just classier Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Right. And hammer was the opposite of that. It was sort of like the answer to, uh, to that. Um, And so it was, um, I, that, and I think that if you watch it from that perspective, like, Oh, this is hammer just trying something new here. I, I don't think you hate it as much as, as you would if you, if you didn't take that approach. Well, that's what frustrates me about it is that they are doing something new with it. Let's push it forward a hundred years and make it modern day society, Dracula. And I was like, Oh, yeah. this is cool. It's a good, a good idea. But they don't do anything with the character. Like there's nothing that's like, I mean, it's just like, you're just like watching a movie set in the year that it came out. And Oh, it, there's also Christopher Lee as Dracula. Who's still just hanging out in a castle. Like there's not yeah. like, they don't really do anything with the present day like they could yeah. have just made it 1872 all the way through and not much would be different outside of like the setting itself like they didn't really um pursue that avenue in a way that could have made like a really interesting sequel that maybe didn't all work but like could have been very entertaining it felt like they were like pushing it forward and then like no just let's bring it back again i don't know yeah i mean it was <laughs> it's it's a hammer movie so it's so, and then it's followed by one more in 73, The Satanic Rites of Dracula, which similarly utilized a modern setting and featured most of the same central characters. So I'm assuming it's a direct sequel to Dracula 8072. I, I honestly don't remember. I don't know if I can watch it. <laughs> I th- I've seen it. You've seen I'm pretty sure I've seen it, yeah. I don't remember. I mean, remember part of me is like, well, it's the last official one. I've watched four of them. Well, Brian, we we have to do our sequel thing. (laughs) You know we have to. (laughs) I am not going to commit to doing Satanic Rites of Dracula. I'd rather do, like, let's find a horror film for next year. And, you know, a few days before we record, we could just, like, I could watch it and we could, like, mention it. I don't want to do a whole hour and a half about Satanic Rites of Dracula. I don't think I have it in me. (laughs) <laughs> wow all right don't we have another night stalker yeah there's another night stalker so how but about see, we just, just talk about that this, and then i'll have a little secures. five minute segment this just you know continues to secure uh my place on this show <laughs> into perpetuity <laughs> like at some point these sequels dry up right like there's no, not going to be <laughs> nothing ever dries up as until long we as get to the 80s around. until we get to the 80s and then it's gonna be like okay i need to fit in some non-horror films <laughs> like it's just gonna be all friday the 13th part five that's right halloween five i always well, loved halloween like, five like, was in the 90s we were always we were always okay with numbers until it gets to double digits and then they don't want to call it they don't want to call it friday the 13th part 10 like only i think land before time got to a part 10 right well, I just <laughs> want to point out that Halloween has two O. Halloween H two O. Yeah, that's 2-0. right. So that's 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 a double digit right there. And now, so with the new Halloween ends, Jamie Lee Curtis has now played Laurie Strode in seven Halloween movies. Okay. And I always thought that Donald Pleasance would hold the record of five because yeah. he was in five of them. And yeah, she was. died in uh, Resurrection, which was the fourth, her fourth one. Yeah. But then David Gordon Green said, nope, you are beating Donald Pleasance's record. You are going to make three more. <laughs> so that's a long, that's a long time. Like she was talking, I just watched her in an interview yesterday and she was like, 
I, I played this character when I was 19. I'm 64 years old now. And I just played her again one more time. That's a long period of your career to be playing the same character. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. It is. So it, it, it uh, is interesting. Christopher Lee only played the character over the course of uh, 15 years ish. Yeah. But like, you don't see the twinkle in his eye. It doesn't look like in 80, 72, like he's like, he's so excited to be back playing this guy. It, it feels just like, will, will, will the cash, will, will, the, will the check clear when I go to the bank next week? That's what I'm reading from his face. <laughs> Where I'm that's confused. not what you read in, in uh, Wicker Man. No. Maybe, oh, well, that's what, maybe we could do Wicker Man, Jonathan. Oh, yeah, that'd be and good. then talk that'd... about Satanic when we talk oh. about that one. Yeah, what year is that? That's 73. Oh, it is. Okay. How about we oh, yeah, do Wicker let's Man do yeah. next let's year? Let's do that one. Let's, and okay, before fine. we before we come on to talk about Wicker Man, I'll watch Satanic Rites, and we can just do a little follow up, like a it. five minute, just like you know, Double just feature. just mention it, but have the majority of the episode be about yeah. Wicker Man because I feel like it's been a while, Jonathan, that we've talked about a really great horror film. Wicker Man you is know, fantastic. Sort of like how all of our other shows go, where we come in to talk about something, and then we spend the vast majority <laughs> of time talking about other things. Yeah, which the listeners love, by the way, they love when. They go, oh, they're talking about Dracula 80, 1972, and then half the episode, we're talking about the monsters and Halloween. They're like, oh, this is great. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> well, you just have to add that in to the podcast title. You know, you just say, oh, Film at 50 also and featuring. <laughs> you, you're also featuring. An I, I, I try to, like, bring it back to our movie. That's, like, my job. But sometimes when well, the movie hardly... is not that interesting like today's i'm like let's talk about halloween let's go for it. but uh wicker man would be a good conversation i don't know what time what time of 73 i don't know if that was like earlier in the year or later but well you uh, better figure it out Brian. so yeah we will talk about satanic during that episode good <laughs> all right so anything else you wanted to say about it i mean so i mean the final scene like how does he kill dracula he just like puts like a shovel like down against his back and then he's like oh and then he and then he like oh dissolves. no actually that bring that no this was a really like, cool way to kill no this was a really cool way to kill dracula yeah and i don't think it was set up all that well from a directorial standpoint so what it was van very helsing, confusing what van helsing did is in that open pit he put like dozens of stakes wooden yeah. stakes he set this trap right and so uh Dracula, he thought he got Dracula, and then of course the girl goes and saves him, or whatever. And then Dracula comes back out, and so he chases Van Helsing outside, and then Van Helsing gets him to fall into the trap, mm -hmm. and so he gets impaled with one of the the wooden stakes, um, inside of this trap. But there were like dozens of wooden stakes mm -hmm. that he had down there. But I think we should have spent more time focusing on Van Helsing making this trap because it was a really ingenious way of making sure Dracula dies. Mm -hmm. Like it was a really cool, cool way of killing Dracula. And it, it just sort of was thrown away with the way that it was directed. Yeah. Like, I feel like the the ending of horror of Dracula is so great. Like it's yeah. so cinematic and, and surprising. And it's like, they kind of, you know, put themselves into a corner with that, back themselves into a corner with that ending because they were never really able to replicate it. The power of that in all of these sequels, it's like, okay, well, how can we ever top that ending? So, you know, it's just like, you know, they resurrect him again and then he's just dying again. And then at the end of 72, it says, what does it, what does it say? Like, finally, rest in peace, like before the end credits. And I'm like, finally, rest in peace. There's another sequel the next year. <laughs> With with Christopher Lee, never stopped. It should just end like James Bond, like Dracula will return. <laughs> well, know? I mean, you know, that's basically what you set up for. And then when they don't come back, you know, then it's sort of like, well, where where's that Dracula movie that we had been planning on having? You know, and, and they just didn't have any more after seventy three. So, but yeah, I mean, let me know if if any of one, two, there's four films in between Prince of Darkness and AD seventy two, starring Christopher Lee as Dracula. You said you've seen Count Dracula from seventy. No, I is... said I haven't seen that. Oh, I thought you were telling me. I thought you said that was the Spanish production. That That's is, and I said I haven't seen it. Oh, I, said I thought you were telling me how great it was. It. Oh, I've okay. heard great things about oh, it, gotcha. know, but I haven't seen that one. Yeah. 
So I might, maybe I'll like just, you know, do little snippets of some of these. I thought it was think. 69 anyway. Well, somewhere around there. This website says 70. Oh, okay. But uh, yeah, and then he's in one called Dracula and Son from 74. <laughs> it's not a Hammer film. Is that that's, like that's kind of like a weird one to go out on? Is that like Sanford and Son? He should have done like you know like how you know Sylvester Stallone did a Rocky and and a Rambo like decades later. Like I feel like after this long run of very quick sequels, like Christopher Lee should have done like one more Dracula in the '90s by like a really talented filmmaker, like one more time. Well, you know, when and Hammer like made it really back, great. <laughs> when, when Hammer came back with the Woman in Black. You know, yeah. it would oh, be yeah. cool to see uh, Christopher Lee as Dracula again. You know, that would have been oh, in that a cool film. <laughs> no, not in that film. Like, it, it's a is a is a separate Hammer film. Like you know? in like the late two thousands, early two thousand tens, like something around yeah. there. Like like yep. one more where he's very old and like maybe he's yeah. only in a few scenes. Yeah, that could have but been it, cool. It would have been cool to have the character of Dracula return to the Hammer universe. It feels like there was something. Yeah, it feels like there was. Uh, you know something missing there mm -hmm. like one more even in the 80s or 90s even if the movie wasn't great like if he had just done it one more time because it's weird that he's in so many so quickly and then never again after 74 <laughs> like, no, i mean now we're just... on to frank langella well that's just because you know hammer just stopped making these dracula movies he was probably so burnt then... out too he was probably like i'm done <laughs> like i don't yeah, need probably to do <laughs> and but then yeah he... Got anything anything more things. about the movie i feel like i mean there's very little story wise scene wise like typically i can come on here and talk about five to seven scenes that i really enjoyed and there's not a whole lot going on in this movie like it's kind of just a blank and i just watched it john i thought johnny alucard <laughs> was an interesting character like i thought he was an interesting character like what is his motivation like what is his reason for doing this, you know, how does he survive all of this time? You know, I thought so. I in 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 that regard, I think that was an interesting character. I think Van Helsing's uh, granddaughter is 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 developed okay. I thought she was like she wasn't just this flat character. She's you know, a she, person in yeah, the movie. She's she's a per <laughs> well, she's a person. She's not just you know some you know archetype she she actually you know had she speaks she had something more to do than you know you might typically expect um and then of course van helsing was an interesting character being the son mm -hmm. of the original van helsing is he the son of the original van helsing or is he the grandson of the original van a well, hundred years later so it's got to be at least grandson, probably great grandson, right? Well, I don't know. And they what... just happen to look exactly the same. <laughs> well, what did wait? Did what? Did uh, Van Helsing's daughter? Did she call when they were in the the graveyard? Did she say that was my grandfather's tomb or my great grandfather's oh, maybe. tomb? Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't know. Like that's where it gets kind of confusing to me. Mm -hmm. So, I just think if you were like me. And you hadn't seen any of these horror films where Christopher Lee played Dracula. Seek out Horror of Dracula. As of this recording, it's on HBO Max. As was Dracula 80, 1972, but not Brides of Dracula and Dracula Prince of Darkness, which I found odd. Like, why do we only have some, not all of them? Well, that's because of the rights to these movies are so messed up. Yeah. Um, all like, is there the... a box set? Is there like a box set DVD Blu-ray set of all of the Christopher Lee Hammer Dracula movies? I don't. I want to <laughs> say I no. I, I want to say no because the rights to these films are just crazy. Yeah. Um, because I know that Warner Brothers owns this one and Horror of Dracula. Oh, okay. But I don't think That's Warner why Brothers it's on HBO owns. Man. But I don't think Warner Brothers owns Prince of Darkness. Okay. Yeah, I had to go into the dark web to find Prince of Darkness. <laughs> it wasn't on HBO Max. So that is um that's the interesting interesting thing about the hammer in America. Satanic Rites of Dracula was on HBO Max. I saw it on the screen. I typed in Dracula and it came up. Yeah. So it's there. So Warner was the Warner's was the 
uh, American distribution company. Okay. Um, they were the distributor. But uh, for a lot of these films, I thought all of them, but I, I guess not. I don't know. It's it's funky. So listeners, if you want to hear our thoughts about the final official Hammer film starring Christopher Lee's Dracula, the Satanic Rites of Dracula, we will talk about it next year when we look at The Wicker Man. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, that takes us to our final two segments. Jonathan, did you pick a modern film to pair this with? Yes, I would pair it. Not with a, uh, not with a film. Okay. Using a limited series event. Okay. Midnight Mass. Ooh, that was sensational. I loved it. I wrote a piece I write for uh, Gold Derby, which uh, they, they, you know, articles about Emmys and Oscars and stuff. And I wrote an article about Midnight Mass. Emmy voters, don't look this over. This is one of the great TV events of the last year. Jonathan, it did not get a single Emmy nomination, which is insane to me. Yeah. That show was spectacular. It was so frightening. It was so well acted, so well shot. Great story. Kept it, it keeps you in a script. Mike Flanagan is <laughs> something else. I know he's he's excellent. I think that I think he is like the heir to Stephen King. He um, is uh so it will have aired three weeks ago, <laughs> but he has a new show called The Midnight Club. Have you heard yeah. of the Midnight Club? Yeah. Do you know anything about it? I don't like, know much about it, except I think that it's just Heather Langenkamp is in it. I, I saw it's, that. It's these kids that are in... Is uh, it more of a Goosebumps type thing, or is it like an R-rated horror show? I, I don't know, because it's, it's it's these kids, probably high school age kids, that are in a, some sort of hospital, and I think yeah. they're they're dying. Like, they all have some sort of disease or something. Um, and so whoever dies first um, will have to come back. And uh, I'm curious to watch at least the first couple episodes this weekend. I want to see what it's all about. And then he's currently in production, I want to say, on uh, Edgar Allan Poe adaptation. Is it the the fall of the Usher? The fall of the house. The fall of the house of Usher. (laughs) House of the fall of Usher. Yeah, fall of the house of Usher. Usher He's making uh, with I think his repertory group of actors who he has in a lot of these projects, and he's just cranking these things out, man. And yeah. Like Midnight Mass was, I feel like was put together really quickly, and it's so just like it's. It feels like something that another director would have spent like eight years getting ready, <laughs> and he just pumped it out like it was a slasher movie or something. It's like wow. So um, yeah, I love everything he does and a Midnight Mass. So <laughs> I'm trying to picture what I'm, someone watching Dracula AD seventy two, and then they put on Midnight Mass. That's that's a jump in quality, Jonathan. Yeah, it's a jump in quality, but it's, you know, the same sort of idea. You bring this ancient vampire right. into the modern world. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I like it. I do, too. <laughs> that's a good one. So I, I went with a movie I've not talked about in the podcast before. I watched it once. It's not great, but it, it is kind of like vampires in a modern setting. And it it does some interesting things with the vampire genre from 2013. Did you see Only Lovers Left Alive by Jim Jarmusch? Mm-mm, Tilda no, Swinton, Tom Hiddleston. And there it's kind of like it has a lot of music in it. And it's a little bit, it's Jim Jarmusch. Do you know much about him? He doesn't make like straightforward narratives. Like he made Broken Flowers with uh, Bill Murray. What's his most famous film? What, Stranger Than Paradise in the 80s. He makes kind of offbeat films, but sometimes he'll play in genres. Like he did a zombie movie a few years ago and he made this vampire movie with Tilda Swinton. And he's always been, he's not one of my favorite filmmakers, but he always, he'll take a trope or genre and he'll do something outside the box. And that's the case of Only Only Lovers Left Alive. And because of that like musical scene at the beginning of Dracula 8072, it got it had me thinking about only lovers left alive because there is a lot of music in it and um, like musician characters and so I like I like that film and uh, so I would I would put that on the list. Nice. So check it out, <laughs> Jim Jarmusch. Um, and then beyond the flick, we've already kind of talked about it. So our segment here was Christopher Lee Dracula movies. Uh, I would rank this third <laughs> from one of the ones I've seen with him. And then Prince of Darkness second, and then Horror of Dracula. If you've never seen one and you only want to watch one, just watch Horror of Dracula. 
It's a beautiful yeah, it's good. film. Like it's it's one of the best horror films of the 1950s, I think I've ever seen. Like it was just really it I, I watched it on HBO Max one night and I didn't expect much and I was really taken with it. And boy, the the look of that movie is extraordinary. Like I just love that late 50s technicolor. They look great. Yeah. So and it's just very atmospheric. Great, that, great, great movie. That and Creature from the Black Lagoon. 54. The two, two best horror films of the 50s. Diabolique is not a U.S. film. That's a really good one. Yeah, I mean, it, it takes till Psycho 1960 where you start to get a little bit more, you know, horror films of interest that have more than just like spooky castles and some stuff yeah. but of like of the spooky castle genre like roger corman was making some edgar Allan poe adaptations i think most of those are early 60s i don't know if yeah make one in the so 50s too. i don't know um what year I mean, was the tingler house of haunted house on haunted hill is 59 i think it's around there yeah i think it's like 59 that's a good uh, kind of kind of a little tongue-in-cheek kind of humorous but it's a good horror film I'd have to I'd have to really think about what are the great horror films of the 50s. I mean, let me pull up. Let's see if there's an article horror, horror films of the 1950s. Cuz I was watching Horror of Dracula and I'm like this is this is about as good as it gets at this time in history. <laughs> like this is what this is this is as, as as strong of a horror film that audiences were getting. Uh, so, the, of course, the year before, we had Curse of Frankenstein, also by Hammer. House of Wax is pretty good. Yeah. yeah. With uh, Vincent Price. Yeah. Uh, we have The Tingler. Oh, I told you William, The Tingler. William Castle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You said Creature from the Black Lagoon. But, yeah, I mean, just looking down here. Okay, here's Diabolique. That's on the list. I mean, most of these movies I've never heard of. The, you have sequels to Creature from the Black Lagoon. Revenge of the Creature. Revenge of the Creature, starring a young Clint Eastwood. <laughs> I believe that's his film debut. Revenge of the Creature. Uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. That's more of a science fiction movie from 56. The Fly from 58. That's more science fiction. Ooh, The Night of the Hunter is really good. Have you seen that? You know... The, the one I... and only movie directed by Charles Lawton. It's more of a drama than it is a horror film, yeah, but it's I... got images. It's got spooky images uh -huh. and kind of a feeling of dread all the way through. That's a good movie. Yeah. I, you know, I, I I can't recall if I... I know that I've definitely heard of it. I can't recall if I've seen it. And then House and Haunted Hill. There's a movie called Curse of the Demon, 1957, that has 100% oh. on Rotten Tomatoes. I have to check that out. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Fathoms. The, the Godzilla. It's not a horror film. <laughs> well, I mean, like a I lot of these, a lot of these are like sci-fi, like you've been mentioning. Yeah. Like, because it was a really big thing with, you know, the, the blob, the blob was 58. The other stuff. You know, horror is really a product of, uh, what horror looks like is really a product of, you know, what fear society has in any yeah. particular moment. And so obviously, Science fiction sort of took over horror films in the 1950s because of the threat of the nuclear bomb mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. And so that's why you see a lot of a lot of that being presented. And the Bad Seed 1956 was like an early version of like the killer kid, the evil kid, the omen kind of thing. Uh, Bad Seed from 56. But yeah, the 50s. I mean, there's some great films every year, but it's not. It's not a great decade for the horror film. It's kind of like stagnant. And we need Psycho to kind of push it in a new direction in 1960. Yeah. So yeah, this is one of the horror of Dracula. <laughs> one of the best horror films of that decade. So check it out if you've never seen it. Let's see. What what else is coming up in 70 in the 70s? Let's see. I know that I <laughs> I want to do uh I, I would like to be on the omen one if you if you don't have anyone for that i'd like to do the omen. okay that's that's in 76 so 76, that, we'll, yeah. we'll see if i'm still doing this in four years uh, you will be because <laughs> that's be. i mean that's what you said back in when we first did our house of dark shadows right i just keep so, it going because my, my love for 70s cinema yeah i just really love talking about these movies and it helps me kind of like get like kind of situated with like where movies were then where they are now it, it kind of helps me figure out cinema when I think about, okay, so what movies were coming out 50 years ago? And then how did the medium change into the eighties and nineties? And 
it's so interesting to i mean and dracula is a great example of a property that almost every decade you have an example of the property and it just and you can tell like what decade we're in by how it's made who's in it who directed it like this that's actually th- like, very true this dracula 80 72 the way that the movie's made it couldn't even exist 10 to 20 years later like audiences wouldn't no. stand for <laughs> you know so and the and the way that a lot of these christopher lee sequels are still kind of like feeling like they're made in the 60s but we're you know once we get to the exorcist and texas chainsaw coming up here you can't really make movies like this anymore and that's why i think some of these you know dark shadows and dracula and some of these by by the time we get to like 75 76 like they're not being made much anymore because audiences are just growing and evolving well, into new but kinds I of mean, horror films. then you have salem's lot which is the answer to that and you know got toby hooper mm-hmm. that did chainsaw massacre now doing salem's lot and this gothic vampire story and you and it's and it works and it's still i in my opinion the best vampire film ever made um, so I, I think that the characters, the idea of vampirism and just like we saw with Midnight Mass, it, it translates to all sorts of situations, mm-hmm. all sorts of places. And so, yeah, you may not get like, you know, a classic, uh, Christopher Lee 1960s <laughs> version of mm-hmm. Dracula, but you get, a you know, a Kurt Barlow that is absolutely frightening. Mm-hmm. And then of course you've got the Nosferatu remake in 79. 79. Yeah. yeah, so and both got that a, and a new, Nosferatu, a new Nosferatu coming out uh, next year. Or the they year just after announced that, so. that yeah. yeah, that the director of The Witch and The Northman and The Lighthouse is doing Nosferatu. That's very yeah. exciting. I'm yeah. curious to see what he, he's a very talented filmmaker. I'm curious to see what he'll do with that. And Bill Skarsgård is supposed to play Count Orlock. Yep, that makes sense. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> All right, so that takes us to the end here. Jonathan, we made it almost two hours. I always love chatting horror movies with you. I'm excited to talk about a really good one with you next year in The Wicker Man. That'll be fun. That'll be good, yeah. <laughs> and then I don't know when uh, Night Strangler... Is it Night Strangler? Night Strangler? And then Night Strangler had one or two sequels. Oh, it had one sequel, and then it was a TV series, right? Well, yeah, The Night Stalker. But next year's movie is called The Night Strangler. Right? The Night Strangler is the second yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's February, when... March. Oh, that's February. Other. Okay. So that would be the next one. And then Wicker Man. Yeah, we just, seem to do this every six months. Well, yeah. <laughs> while you're on, let me just see when when did the Wicker Man come out? I oh, yeah. would guess that's a later in the year movie. Like that feels like it would have been like a fall release. I'll be surprised if this says January. Yep. Oh. <laughs> Whoa, wait a second here. So the Wicker Man opened in the UK in December 1973 and did not open in the United States until August of 1974. Oh, well then you'll have to decide what you want to do with that. So I've done like once or twice a year I'll do, talk about a movie that gets like a release elsewhere, but I try to keep it to movie i try to keep it to when it opened in the united states okay well that sounds good because then we have something for 74 i wasn't sure there was going to be anything in 74 <laughs> so i'm sorry oh, i thought wicker man offerings. was then we got burnt offerings, burnt too, offerings. which is 76 <laughs> but uh yeah so regardless let me just look up when did uh night strangler you said right yeah night strangler night strangler i want to say that was a that was a tv movie it would have been probably a year after the last one. Ooh, I like the runtime, an hour ten. <laughs> well, that's good. That's a good, good, good amount. So, when did that air? That aired on television on January sixteenth, nineteen seventy-three. Wow. <laughs> so that would right be a January top. recording. Yeah. All right. If we, if if I can't go a year and a half without you, Jonathan, maybe we'll just do a Satanic Rites of Dracula episode. <laughs> If we have to, if there's no other horror, the Halloween episode. if there's no other horror films in October of 73, if there's nothing, okay, then we'll do it. 
All right. That sounds <laughs> but good. if there's if there's <laughs> something else, wasn't there like Theater of Blood or something that you said oh last time? Oh my gosh, yes, we have to watch Theater of Blood. When was when that? Is, when, is when did that come out? out? That's uh, Vincent Price, right? All these good films. Yeah, that is an amazing. You're gonna love that one. Theater of Blood. Yeah, you're gonna like. You're gonna like that. Is seventy three. Ooh, that one's almost two hours. Yeah, it's a long I don't movie. Like that. <laughs> well, I don't. It's it's a it's it's good though. Like it's good. So that was. That was April of seventy three. April, wow. Okay. So we're so it's it's like there it's January, April, April, and then August of seventy four. Yeah. All right. Last one. Website Satanic. Ugh, you're gonna make me watch and talk about that movie. <laughs> well, we never end up talking about that movie. Yeah, we'll just talk, talk about, about other, other stuff. things. Yeah. Wait, what? Oh. So this movie opened in Germany in November of 73 and it doesn't even have a US release date. Great. So we'll just stick with the Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> so it technically came out in Germany in seven, in November 73. Okay. So, so if I need October if I need a US. sounds good. If I need an, a Halloween episode, I guess that could that might be the one. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. But I'm not promising. <laughs> you know what? You're just going to we'll get see. to that point. And you're going to be like, what am I going to do for Halloween? <laughs> oh, there's one more Dracula movie. I guess I'll get Jonathan back. All right, Jonathan, that takes us to the end here. Thanks for being on Film at 50. It was fun Happy to talk Halloween. about this movie. I'm glad you liked it more than I did. Happy Halloween, everybody. And happy birthday to me. Today, the release of this episode is my 38th birthday. Just slowly wow. making my way to 40. Wow. I'm okay about it right now. Okay. Until I'm actually 40, and then I'll be well, like, it's, what? It's, 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 it's better than Dracula, you know? I mean, he's pushing yeah. 600 now, so. <laughs> That's right. Just and think I'm not of gonna, it that way. I'm not going to ask you to to uh, tell our listeners where they can find you. You don't you don't ever share that. No. Okay. <laughs> You're the mysterious guest. Like every other guest I put online, like, oh, you can find their Twitter here, their Instagram here. <laughs> and you, you're you just Jonathan Moore. <laughs> yeah, you can find me here. You can find, Film at 50. find you here at Film at 50 every few months. We get you back. <laughs> so, yeah, if, uh, if that works out, let's do uh, Night Strangler next. Uh, so January every year, I do kind of a wrap up. I do a couple final yeah. episodes looking back at the year that was. So that would be in February. So we would record Sounds that episode good. in January. Sometimes Sounds good. Sound good. All right. Thanks for being here, Jonathan. Thanks to all okay. of you for listening. You can find us online at film at 50.com. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Check out my YouTube channel, Brian Rowe video for all things Oscars. Dracula 80, 1972 didn't get any Oscar nominations. I didn't think so. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about a movie down the road that did. And until next time, remember 50 never looked this good. <laughs>